Hey, how's it going? Um, how's the day been so far? Pretty good? Good, all right. All right, good. I'm the last speaker. I see a bunch of people leaving. Makes me feel really good. Thanks. Um, cool. So I had a retail. I'm going to show you a video. That one always twists my noodle. Can you believe that one? Every single day, more iPhones and babies. It's crazy. It's totally crazy. So as I was about to say before I interrupted myself with my own video, um, <laughs> I, I headed the retail innovation team for eBay Inc. And um, I'm really excited to be here. <laughs> first, first shot, first try, swear to God. Um, and so what our team does, I think is pretty cool. I think I have the best job in the company, maybe the world which is try to find the best technology around the world and infuse it into the physical environment. Um, my story, in case you're wondering, is I was part of an acquisition that eBay made in 2010. It was called Milo. And, uh, and about a year and a half in, I made a pitch to our CTO. And I said, we have the most amazing portfolio of technology for e-com in the world. But it's only about 8% of a lot of our retail clients' sales. He was like, that's a really good point. <laughs> Want to start a team? And I was like, yes. <laughs> so we started. Um, and and you know, retail to me is a passion because I don't know if you guys knew this, but uh, one out of every four people in the country are employed by retail. Do you guys know that? You don't hear in retail? Anyone interested in retail? <laughs> I don't know how fast to go through some of this stuff then. Um, and so things our team has done in the past. So um, Kate Spade Saturday was a project of ours. It was here. And they approached us. And they said, this is Kate Spade. And they said, we want to open up our first store in the US. What should we do? And I was like, huh? Let's do something crazy. Let's make your first store the entire island of Manhattan. And so, um, and so we took over these four storefronts in the city. Anyone see this? Play with it? <laughs> Five people. All right, thanks. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> and uh, we just rented out the first six feet of every store. So it was totally empty. No associates, no inventory. And you can see here on the right side, there's like this um, kind of a touch screen. So it was existing glass. We put products in the storefront. And the glass, the existing glass, we turned into a touch screen using this stuff called touch foil, which is an adhesive skin you put on the back of glass and turns the front of it into a touch screen. Anything you saw in this window, you could have delivered to you for free within an hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's pretty cool. Got a lot of orders. So like random places, like <laughs> 3 a.m. in the Lower East Side, it was like, okay, we get it. We're going to bars. <laughs> yeah. um, but what was so cool about this, and this gets to a bit of the metaphor that I'm going I'm to introduce to you, which is the online versus offline session. Is see on the top right here, that little black window? Can you guys see that? So that was actually an infrared web that I had shooting out into the sidewalk. And so we knew for the first time ever exactly how many people were walking by every storefront, and then how many of them stopped and looked at it, and then of them, how many went and touched it. So we helped Kate Spade Saturday figure out where to open up their first store pre-capital investment using real data. So it's pretty cool. We also did this thing um, with Westfield in San Francisco where we opened up the first stores ever for Tom's and for Rebecca Minkoff, um, and also a big storefront for Sony, which I can tell you about later. Um, and what we've realized is that, as I'm sure you guys know, customer expectation is changing rapidly, rapidly. Anyone seen a version of this slide at some point in their life? It's like the most common slide in the universe. Um, so I don't know if you guys knew this. When the iPhone 4S came out, it had more computing power than the first space shuttle. Yeah. Actually, I think Apollo 11, I was just reading this last night, had only 64 kilobytes of memory. And that landed on the friggin' moon. <laughs> so we have a lot of, you know, this is fundamentally changing the way we expect to engage with our physical world. And, um, and I'll talk a little bit about the pervasiveness of this. I'm sure you guys know this. But, you know, in the US, we all have smartphones. A lot of us have tablets. Actually, and this is pretty, pretty interesting. I was actually surprised by this. Um, for the first time in the second quarter of 2013, more smartphones were sold globally than feature phones. It's incredible. And a lot of this is actually thanks to Google, <laughs> to Android. Um, who here wakes up with their phone? Anyone? Yeah, see? Real stat. Um, two thirds of people use this as their alarm. It's crazy. And people generally use phones from like 12 to 5 p.m., you know, like around now and you're a little bored, you know, I'm just throwing hot air at you, you kind of doing Facebook or whatever. Uh, meetings is my personal favorite. But we found that tablet usage is a little later, 6 to 10 p.m. So when you're, when you're thinking about designing for the form factors, you think about where they are. are you, is it a lay back in bed? Is it in a meeting? So it would be a little faster. Um, <laughs> could say maybe all this tells you is 25% of people are liars, your call. <laughs> But we know on average, and this is average, so including millennials and Generation Z, that people are using their phones 150 times a day, which is insane. There's an app called Checky. Put it on your phone. It'll tell you how many times you use it. I was embarrassed. Um, and often, when retail thinks about the kind of three most important screens, they think about your tablet or your desktop or your phone. And they're forgetting, often, the most important thing, which is their store. So when you walk into a store, there's nothing that's going to get in your way. You're seeing this beautiful visual merchandise. You see the product. And your desire there is to connect with the brand. And in fact, today, today, 75% of all purchases still happen within 15 miles of someone's home. So it's big. Um, I mentioned showrooming. I don't know what showrooming is. Yeah? Everyone do it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, a lot of people showroom. Get into a store, check the price, buy it online, and leave. But the thing is, there's actually something happening that's much more common now, which is called the web rooming. So web rooming is kind of the reverse of that. It's I've done a bunch of research online or on the phone in the store, and then I buy it in the store, which is tough for associates, by the way, because maybe you become an expert on like three products, and they've got, what, 5,000 products to cover? It's kind of tough. Um, but here's some stats that blew my mind. So this is a little bit complicated. I'll explain it to you. So this is from left to right, how many people are doing some sort of research online ahead of time, then some sort of research on their mobile phone or something in the store. So if you look at the bottom line here, it's insane. If someone does research ahead of time and is on their mobile phone doing research in the store, the chance they convert is 86%. And the average lift in AOV, average order value, sorry, I'm a retail nerd, 40% uh, lift. That's insane. When I saw this, I was kind of 
like that guy. <laughs> um, so we know the future of retail is going to be different. And here's a bit of the evolution that at least I've seen in retail over the last couple of years, because they're trying. We are trying. So first was, was digital signage. Anyone been to the, the Burberry store on Regent Street in London? OK. 120, one person? Or was that just like an itch? Oh. <laughs> um, so it has 120 screens in this store. They have a full-time staff of like 10 people just developing content. And this middle one, you can see that the really big one there, uh, it's called um, it's laser phosphorus display. So it's emissive. So to run this entire thing, which is I think it's like 20 by 10 meters, takes as little electricity as a hair dryer. It's great, cool to the touch, totally nuts. Um, but I think a question that we need to ask is, what does this solve for the customer? Is it solving a pain point? Empowered Associates, everyone here I'm sure has been to an Apple store. They can do anything, right in the power of their hand. And it's amazing. And when you look at Apple's success, they have, I think they sell it's like $6,000 per square foot, highest in retail, in the history of retail. The next closest is Tiffany's at 3,000, which is <laughs> still pretty rad. So obviously, it helps if you empower your associates. We've seen tools for customers, so apps that work in the store. Starbucks has been destroying this. We'll see what Apple Pay does. But, but last year, it was actually 14 or 15% of all of Starbucks purchases happened on their app. It's $1.5 billion on items that have nothing to do with web, but it's all digital transactions, which is crazy. Um, Actually, this is one of my favorite examples of, of a cool customer app. So IKEA has a problem, which I'm sure you guys can, can if you've been to IKEA recently, um, where like, if, you're in your, if you're in your room or whatever room you're, you're trying to put this furniture in, you have no idea what the size of the furniture is. right? But when you're in IKEA, you see the furniture, and you're like, shit, how big is my room? <laughs> but they have more, this is a crazy fact, they have more IKEA catalogs printed in the world than the Bible, only book on the planet. So everyone's got one of these things. So they're like, oh, I know what you do. You set it down, and you back up, and you use your phone, and it will create a life-size image of this in your room. So you can see what it looks like. That was pretty cool. Um, so here, here's part of the challenge of, of, of consumer expectation, is that people now don't want to talk to other people <laughs> in stores. Uh, this, is, this is a graph of, on the left, people who would rather use their own device for these things, so like looking up an item price, getting product info, making a payment. And in the bottom right is how much they'd like to talk to someone to do these things. It's really tough. In fact, half of people now think they know more about products than the associate does. <laughs> so what you're starting to see more of now is digital interactivity. Um, and if you've been to the Adidas store, I think it's the, the one here, in 14 of their best stores around the country, they put up these big touch screens. No, not transactional, just big touch screens. And, um, the results were pretty amazing. It was pretty simple, just kind of like play with the product. If an item was in here, it had twice the throughput, twice the sales, just by being in the touch screen. And there was a halo effect, so all the items around the, the little digital thing, 22% lift, just by being in proximity. And I think the stat is that 54% of people today would like some sort of digital interactivity in a store. So people want this. And I think it's millennials are, my pants are really tight. <laughs> um, <laughs> My wife says I'm getting too skinny. I'll show her. Um, <laughs> uh, millennials are 213% more likely to be influenced by in-store digital, which is pretty interesting. And so finally now, we're seeing a smarter store. This is kind of the internet of things. Anyone heard of Hointer up in Seattle? Yeah, OK. So I'll tell, I'll tell the rest of you. It's crazy. You walk in, and you have their app, and they only have one of every single item on the floor, just one. So, you say, I like this pair of pants, this pair of pants, and then it shows a list in a cart. You tell it the size, you know, okay, I want, I want to try these on, and it goes, boop, go to fitting room four. So you walk over to fitting room four, and I swear to God, when you walk into the fitting room, there's two chutes, an in chute and an out chute. In the in chute, the pants just start piling up. <laughs> so you, you know, try the stuff on, and when you're done with it, you put it in the out chute, and it just disappears from your phone. And then to finish, you just say pay. And he goes, OK, you ready to go? <laughs> you, just, you just walk out. <laughs> like, that's it. That's the entire thing. It's crazy. So a bit of an extreme example, but we do know that stores are getting more intelligent in a lot of ways. You've all heard of Beacon, which is very overused, but it is interesting. Um, you know, there's things like LED pulsing, which I'll tell you a little bit about later. But basically, you can have LED lights in the ceiling now that pulse at a rate your eye can't see, but your phone can. 
so you know exactly where you are, which is kind of nuts. Hypersonic geolocation where your phone can hear it, but you can't. There's a lot of things coming, coming down the road. And so the metaphor that I want you guys to, to leave with if you're interested in retail is that a physical session is actually no different than an online session. Um, and there's a bunch of stuff here. I will have this presentation for you afterwards if you'd like. Um, but basically, when you are doing e-com stuff, let's go, here we go, and you're trying to assess how good your website is, essentially what you do is you think about the drop-off points. How many people go from the home page to search, search to results, results to product, product to cart, cart to buy. And every single drop-off, you try to limit. So basically, you're going to decrease the friction, maybe improve the design system, maybe just make it a little faster, and that's how you increase sales. Well, a physical, well, let me see, here we go. A physical session is identical to that. When you cross the threshold of a store, your session has kind of begun. And there's a series of moments where either you're going to browse or you're going to search. And you're going to determine what it is you want to do and if you're going to leave. And so what we've done as a team is essentially tried to figure out what are those acute moments in the physical world that you can put technology in and remove all the friction. So there's a bunch of examples here. Again, I will give this to you guys if you want it. Um, some fun, because I'm seeing that I'm running out of time, big time. <laughs> um, so a fun example, I was, I was talking about hyperlocation. So there's this company called um, Indoor Atlas. Have you guys, anyone heard of Indoor Atlas? OK, it's amazing. Basically, they, uh, they were studying Arctic foxes. <laughs> and they found that Arctic foxes will do this thing where they run around a field, and then they'll run in the middle, and they'll just dive. And like, I think it's 80% of the time, they'll get a mouse. And they were like, how the F did they do that? <laughs> and so they found that they essentially had this, it was almost like a magnetic map they'd build of the, of the field. And then they'd find a deviance of it, and they'd jump in. And so they, they do this thing called magnetic fingerprinting, where they'll use the, I don't know the word for it, the magnetometer or something in your phone, the compass. They'll walk around the store, they get a mapping of it, and then they make that into an API, which when you walk around the store, they know exactly where you are, just based on that fingerprint of that square foot area, which is pretty cool. Um, Anyone see the new Connect? This is crazy. OK, so, so you know, a, big, a big theme here is, too, is you can capture all this data you would normally lose. So when you're in a physical store today, and I may or may not be doing this in a lab somewhere, um, I can have two Connects, two new Connects on the ceiling that would essentially be making a 3D environment, a replica of that store in any given millisecond. And so with the new Connect, which has 15,000 distinguished points of detection, I could know exactly what you did when you walked around, all the products you touched, but get this, I could know your heart rate the whole time. You know how I'd know it? See the vein moving in your neck. <laughs> yeah, be creeped out. <laughs> um, so we talked about some of that stuff. We did a project with Toys R Us, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, this is another example of something my team's done where we found that people in Toys R Us often know who they're buying for, not what to buy, so we made a big gift finder right in the front of the store in Redwood City which is Silicon Valley. Um, we found that if someone touched this, 95% chance all the way down to maps. We show products listed by how important they were, um, and then show a map of how to find it in the aisles as well. And so again, I'll give you all this stuff, because I think my presentation's a little too long for the time I had. Oh, is it cool? Oh, OK. Well, I'm already kind of blasting through it. Um, so here's, here's an example of, you know, as you're going through that session, a moment where maybe there's a lot of friction today, and you'd want to, you know, remove it. So, anyone try and make up in stores? No, <laughs> I was looking for a funny. Um, and so it's it's kind of a pain. Like you walk into the store and you have to try on stuff, and then you take it off. You try another. And it's like it's a pain, right? Like it's really annoying. And so this company called Facecake built this thing, which I think is amazing, where you look into a camera, and I think this may be the Sephora's actually, and it would just augment actual colors on your face, but match your pigmentation, which is pretty cool. Um, I don't know that I totally believe in like 3D clothing quite yet, but there's definitely a universe where you can remove friction using some of this augmented reality, and it's, it's, a, it's a part of the store. Uh, and then finally, you've all heard about paying, right? How do you, how do you make paying invisible? And part of the way we're thinking about retail is, if someone spends you know, 25 minutes in a store on average, and 30% of it's doing stuff they don't want to do, how do you remove that? So like if a line, for example, is over, 70, it's over seven minutes long, there's a 79% abandonment rate. So how do you make payments a little faster? Um, 
And you guys all know this is a crazy, crazy space, and there's a lot of people coming into it, uh, including PayPal and Apple. <laughs> so the, the real takeaway for this, and then let's, let's get into some questions, is I think the future of retail is not going to be tech for the sake of tech. You're not going to want to walk in and see crazy like holographs, and there's this thing called a splare, which shoots a stream of steam into the air and projects on it. It's like, come on. You don't really want to do that. You'd like it to be a store. You want to deal with the people and the products. You want to be immersed in that. And I think people don't truly want to be heads down on their phone in the store. So part of it's about challenging the definition of mobility, realizing that you know, if this thing were to sit there, it's not really mobile. It probably won't move unless I grab it. It just happens to be on our bodies. How do you make your body part of the mobility? And the natural surfaces, the honest wood and metal and glass, come alive at the moments that you'd like it. Um, and so what I will say is a little teaser, um, which is we have a big launch coming up on the 12th. That's why I'm part of the reason I'm here besides this, um, which is going to be our, I don't want to call it store of the future because I think it's the store of today. It'll be down in Soho. And it's literally going to be our team's vision of what retail should be. Um, so I totally invite you guys all to watch out for it and come down and visit. Um, I'll be there doing customer studies and stuff. And I think you're going to like it a lot. So with that, um, thanks. <laughs> All right, thanks, Healy. Let's dive into some questions here. Uh, so let's start with uh, let's start with the first one because there was some kind of cool and creepy stuff you covered in your presentation. Have you uh, encountered customer backlash around uh, how they're tracked or monitored, and you know, buying habits are also personal habits? You know, how do you how do you think about the balance between privacy and also providing a more seamless experience? Totally. Yeah. So privacy is a really delicate issue, um, and what we found through studies is. If you collect someone's data, but you can guarantee it's just for them, then they actually like it. Yeah, OK, I know you're not going to share this. It's just for me. Then it makes my life easier. If I walk into a store, and it knows all my sizes, and what I bought before, what my favorite shoe is, or whatever it is, or that I don't wear socks, like, great, don't sell me socks. So that can be nice. But when it comes to things that are kind of being gathered anonymously, anonymously um, it's a very, very thin line. And what we're making sure to do is, if we are gathering stuff about you, we always get your permission, 100%. And if not, then we're not going to ever connect what's happening to your ID. It's just going to be part of the, the aggregate data amount. So we know, you know, for example, we can tell a product designer, hey, this product, you know, 80% of it goes into the fitting room, but no one buys it. So they can do some research. Why didn't they buy this product? There's initial interest, but is it something wrong with the fit? Stuff like that. Um, so uh, let me ask two questions here. So, so customers uh, still need to do the retail research. A good question about will we ever get to standardization across brands and stores where we can just you know, find what we're looking for without the brand noise, I guess, is the question. Hmm. Customers still need to do the retail research. You mean research standardization? Yeah, it struck me as uh, this idea that right now we go to a different website for everything, right? Oh, yeah. Or a different store yeah. for everything. Right. Will there be aggregation, and will it be more about just, I want this, and here are all my options in front of me? Do you think about that at all in your, in your role? You know, there could be a universe where that happens. Um, right now, you'd be amazed. So there's a couple, couple fun facts for you. So right now, most retailers don't actually have exact parity of what's sold online and in the store. In fact, it's a very, very thin Venn diagram. And so it means when they want to show the stuff they have in the store online, they don't have all the digital assets they need, like the photos, <laughs> romance copy, like even price accessible. It's really hard to get that stuff. So there's a ton of catalog work. In fact, if you wanted to start a startup that just made catalogs better, you'd probably make a lot of money really fast if you can pull it off. Um, but also, you know, retail today is very, uh, they're very nervous about sharing data, especially with one another. Even prices by zip code. Like, for example, Walmart has different prices by store. They don't want to share that to the competitors. They don't even know. Um, you know, they also don't want to share preferences. I mean, MCX is potentially changing this, but if Walmart has an exact idea of everything you've ever bought for your house, and you walk into a Target, and then they, you can use that data to make the Target experience better, they've lost some of their competitive edge. So could it exist in the future? Yes. Will customers have to demand it? Absolutely. Um, I do think that there's a future of the world where you have an offline cookie, which is your ID that's tied to you, and your preferences are kind of shared with every, every um, retailer. And it could even be a blind indice. Like, hey, like, can't tell you what they bought, but from 1 to 10, 10 being the most, 10 is likely they're going to be a really good customer for jewelry. Um, but we'll see. 
Another question here uh, about um, the work that your team is doing and how it fits into eBay's core competencies and goals. And, and a question, you know, I think that <laughs> like a, lot of us who, a lot of us who are doing innovation or leading innovative teams within large companies, yeah. that's always the question about, is there a culture clash? You know, a lot of people know eBay as the auction site. And obviously, the, eBay, the companies evolve so much. Right. Talk, talk a little bit about that. Yes, absolutely. So it's funny you mentioned that. Most people, when you say I work for eBay, they're like, are you going to auction stuff? Is that so um, just so you guys know, auctions are only 20% of the eBay business today. And 80% uh, and, and of the things are also new that are sold on eBay. So eBay is a tremendously different company and has been doing crazy things in mobile. I don't know if you guys knew this, but seven years ago, we had a $0 mobile business. Uh, this last year was $22 billion business, some crazy growth. We sell, it's 213 pieces of clothing, shoes, and accessories every single minute on mobile. And this one is crazy. 14,000 vehicles on mobile every single week. <laughs> yeah, some, some a-hole bought a, bought a $1.4 million Ferrari, an Enzo, on his iPhone app. And I was like, come on, man. Like, oh, yeah, bought a wine and a Ferrari. <laughs> um, so sorry, I digress. The company overall, though, <laughs> is, is eBay.com. Um, it's also eBay Enterprise, which is a company that you may not have heard of. It used to be GSI and Magento. So when you go to like RalphLauren.com or Estee Lauder or Bonobos, Tom's, Roy Parker, you, you name it, we're usually powering their website, often their customer service, um, and even their fulfillment. We have six and a half million square feet of fulfillment space. And, so, and then we had PayPal. It's now breaking off. So when you think about the eBay Enterprise business of powering their e-com, um, we're doing a very similar thing in powering their store. And that's kind of where the fit is, if it makes sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, along those same lines, I mean, do you think that eBay has an advantage over startups to really think about the future of retail, or does size sometimes kill speed? It's a good question. Um, I'm really lucky. So we have a 17-person crew in a secret, <laughs> not anymore, off-campus lab, um, and, uh, and we are able just to run. So we've been really lucky. I mean, we, we essentially are a startup. and. One of the benefits is that we get funding with no strings attached, which I know money's cheap right now, but it's still nice. Um, it's also nice to take all that risk up front to, and then be able to figure out the business model. Because if I sell someone on something that I'm doing and get them into more, more of the core competencies of eBay Inc., well, then I've, I've paid for my team because they're going to be on marketplaces and they're going to be on PayPal and it works out. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, size is always tough and it's, it's always a balance. You have to choose. Uh, essentially when you, when you join the beast. And we've been lucky that we've got some kind of executive air cover, but um, I, I have known moments where it has definitely killed, killed products. Cool. And then the, the experimental store opens when again? Um, running back in like legal, one would say. So I think the announcement will come the, it's not an experimental store, by the way. It's Sorry, a real store. It's, it's the, it's the not, future store. It's not store. eBay branded, it's by the, the way. It's the current it's store. another brand store. We're just helping with the tech. Got it. Right. Um, it. I think the announcement will be the morning of the 12th. All right. And then well, you can we'll go and stay, check it out on the 15th. Yeah. We'll all stay tuned. I just wanted to plug it. You know, yeah, we're, thanks. We're yeah, yeah, check it out. In Soho, just cool. hang out for it. Thank you, Healy. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs>